Very good evening to all dear participants. Uh, maybe we'll have other five minutes to try to start the program. So we are waiting for some more participants to join. So it's uh, uh, almost four or five. So we'll start and we'll uh, let uh, the participants in. Um, dear participants, thank you so much. On behalf of Institution Innovation Council of MAT uh, Engineering College, on behalf of MAT Business Incubation Center, uh, let me uh, proudly welcome each and every one of you for yet another wonderful session uh, uh, in entrepreneurship. So. It's uh, maybe this entrepreneurship is a need of the hour, and we are taking all possible uh, steps to promote entrepreneurship in all uh, means for sustainable uh, development. So with, uh, with this, we have today with us uh, Ben Lee. 
she is the co-founder of uh, Hungary uh, Lab. So before going, uh, who Bayan Lee is, what uh, remarkable achievements and why she here for today's program, uh, uh, formally, uh, let us start with the uh, prayer song of Tamil Thai, or the traditional, uh, traditional uh, prayer song of Tamil Nadu. Thank you so much uh, for listening. Now, about uh, Ben Lee. Uh, B is an entrepreneur, futurist, and former investment banker at the intersection of finance, operations, technology, and uh, social innovation. She has over 15 plus years of experience working with hundreds of entrepreneurs of all sizes across 30 countries. She's now the founder of Hungry Lab, where she specializes in building startups and designing the collaborative value networks and uh, global ecosystems needed to grow them. She has uh, been a TEDx speaker, uh, appeared in Incorporate Magazine and uh, presents frequently around the world. She is a board member and advisor to a diverse array of startups. She is a member of Women in Blockchain and a mentor for Blockchain for Social Impacts, Decentralized Hackathon and Incubator. B is a certified rescue diver and uh, when not at work, you will find her scuba diving and raising awareness for ocean conservation. Um, she like she is not only an entrepreneur she loves fun uh, and uh, she's an anthropologist she is a professional latin dancer and she's also a stand-up comedian um the great regeneration of 2020 together is a best-selling book in amazon where we have authored uh, so such a privileged guest uh, we have here and uh, she is also part of our silver ring uh, uh, talks uh, ben, it's it's a it's a privilege for all of us. Uh, uh, ben, it's a, it's a privilege for all of us for kindly accepting an invitation and you being here. It's a, it's a kind of inspiration. You know, today I could see a lot of uh, industry leaders, even top industry leaders from Kanyakumari district, are, are are attending this program because just we have Ben on our uh, platform. It's, it's, a, it's a real privilege to have you, ma'am, and I have no words to express my uh, uh, sincere thanks to you for kindly of accepting. And on, on the Indian tradition, namaste, uh, yeah. kindly of accepting, namaste, uh, and... Uh, Vanakam in uh, Tamil Nadu. <laughs> Vanakam, ma'am, thank you so much. And the uh, virtual platform is all yours. We are, we, are, we are waiting for you. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for uh, this kind invitation. I have been doing a lot of speaking on virtual webinars uh, during this um, uh, you know, COVID time. And I know it's a very anxious time for many of us, especially those uh, startups and entrepreneurs, and especially the ones that have recently just started their business. And so before I get into more details, I'd like to tell a little bit more about why I do what I do. Um, and, and why it's related to so many things that are happening around the world. So I'm a futurist and I started the Hungry Lab uh, a few years ago as a way to look at and anticipating the challenges that we're going to face as a society. Climate change, um, you know, the need to uh, adapt and innovate in terms of the skills needed for the future and how we need to innovate um, our education and schooling system in order for the next generation to be prepared for what will be an ever increasingly volatile future. And so what this means is we need to really completely rethink and, and reshape how we as a society and as a, as a humanity are going to move forward. And that requires working around the world with many different stakeholders corporates, startups, entrepreneurs, academics, teachers, students, social enterprises, because everybody is a stakeholder in the system. And uh, right now, the traditional system is, is what has gotten us into trouble in, in the first place and what has brought us to so many challenges. And so we need to start rethinking about what is that new framework or structure in which we can create a more inclusive and uh, an accessible future to more people, 
especially those at the bottom of the pyramid, especially to the young people who have so much talent but don't have enough opportunity. And especially in a rapidly changing workforce where the skills that are taught in school are not going to translate to what is needed. Um, and so how do we bridge all of those gaps? So that's essentially what I do. And I work with everyone and I work with all sorts of organizations. And the Hungry Lab was created as a global movement and a global platform to educate and inspire action and transformation in, um, in everything. And so we have a global online reschool of the future, relearn, rethink, regenerate. And I, I talk a lot about in my, in my uh, work around the world that it's not enough to talk about building resiliency. If we're just talking about resiliency, we're already falling behind. We need to move from a resiliency mindset to a regenerative mindset. Now, what's the difference? I hear a lot more people using those more interchangeably these days, and there's a huge difference. Resiliency has an implicit acceptance in the current system, meaning that the current system, we have to accept it. It's going to continue to hit us and hit us and hit us. Uh, and we have to just be able to take it and be strong and, and bounce back up. That's okay until you, at a certain point, you can no longer take it anymore. And that's what we're seeing right now at an individual level, at a community level, at a climate level, and a planetary level. Our mother nature cannot take it anymore. Our, uh, you know, the people's, um, they need a new mindset and, um, and, and the workplace and education system, it's, it's COVID has laid bare a lot of the challenges that need to be addressed. Regeneration is actually something that mother nature does very well. And if you actually look at mother nature, you can learn a lot about the ecosystem and how everything has its place and it had, and mother nature doesn't waste. And the biggest challenge we have these days is the, weight, the, the waste of human um, potential. And with regeneration, it's about completely transforming a system and redesigning it so that in the future, we can move forward stronger, more inclusive, better, and more forward thinking and sustainable. And that is that shift in mindset that is so important for how we move forward. And I spend a lot of time working with startups because startups are essentially, you know, they're, they're problem solvers. Entrepreneurs are problem solvers at heart. They see a problem, they see how they might be able to solve it and in a way make money so that it can generate income and be sustainable. Now, that is at the heart of how we need to approach the future. But I want you to guys to think a little bigger in terms of what problems are we going to solve and what actually is the right solution? Because what we come up with and the ideas that we come up with are a product or a byproduct of our life experiences, of our influences, of our biases, of our perspectives. If we only have a very narrow definition of what a solution is based on a very narrow perception of what a problem is without the ability to take into account other points of view, the ability to have empathy, the ability to look at it from a larger ecosystem and a spider web of connections, and we can only see linearly, then we are missing out and we are not truly identifying the right problem to solve, and we are not truly identifying the right solution. And that is how we continue to cycle in this vicious cycle, rather than build a regenerative system. And so what the, a lot of the work I do is helping startups and helping organizations like think tanks, accelerators, government funding agencies, develop new models and new frameworks for how do we incorporate a better definition of sustainability. How do we incorporate a more long lasting and more sustainable definition of impact investing or of startup innovation? And you know, the, the title of this talk is called A Brave New World because that's, that's essentially where we're going. And the, we, if we can, 
we, you know, you've heard the saying, you don't know where you're going if you don't know where you come from. One step further, the problem that we've arrived at today is we can't even agree how we got here and what was the cause. And we can't even agree on what the problem is. And we can't even agree on the, what the solution is. We can't agree on the problem. I'm an American. You can see from the news every day in the US, it's a, it's a prime example of how truth and how fact is distorted and debated and politicized and polarized to a point where people cannot even agree on the definition of truth. And so how does that help us when we have a pandemic to solve, when people don't even believe that the pandemic is real or can even come up with a shared definition of what our reality is? And, and so that is one of the biggest struggles and yet one of the biggest opportunities in terms of where we're going and where we need to go in terms of schooling, because it's all a part of the education and the schooling and the influence. And there's a lot of opportunities now where startups have the ability to influence education like no other before. Uh, no other before. And through our work, we've defined several areas that need continuous disruption and startups are in a perfect place to do that if they can break out of the traditional mindset. Because even in the startup community, you know, I've done a lot of work with folks from Silicon Valley and, and all those places. And it's still a very narrow mindset a lot of times when they think, oh, you know, we'll just do another food delivery startup or we'll just, you know, do how everybody else is done without understanding the, the ripple effects of the consequences around the world. Or, or not caring about the consequences, Facebook being a, just a big, big example, but there's many smaller examples. And so what I dare everyone to think about, um, and when I talk to young innovators, I talk to them about this, it's how do we think broader in terms of the technologies and the solutions we apply? How can we um, design the business models design the hiring practices, design our ecosystem so that it is no longer just a linear value creation, meaning from my supplier to me to my customer, but a systems-wide value creation where everybody who participates in my platform has the ability to make money and in a way that is environmentally beneficial and that is where we're seeing the industry go. We are seeing it go from, you know, the, the, the stakeholder economy, the stakeholder capitalism, I mean, sorry, shareholder capitalism to stakeholder capitalism. And what's the difference? Well, back in the 80s and 90s, especially in the US, you've seen the Wall Street people, you know, the, 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 the blood sucking, you know, the, um, you know, people who just want to take over the companies and, and on and all of that. And, there was a time and a place for that. And you had CEOs saying that the only thing they cared about was shareholder value and how much return they gave to their investors. That drove and developed a whole generation, multiple generations of short-term thinking that got us into that problem where people are just chasing after the next quarterly profits because that's what their bonuses were aligned with versus the longer term thinking. Now, that is another mindset that needs to be shifted. And how, when we think about designing new innovative forms of business models, especially uh, in, in alignment with new emerging technologies. Right now I'm doing a global AI study for um, a major uh, government donor in Europe on, you know, the, the, uh, on APAC and, and Africa and the future there. And what we're seeing consistently is the fact that there is an open slate for innovation in this area because people still, to be honest, most people still have no idea what they're doing. The, the vast, and I'll be very honest here, the, the ma vast majority of investment money is dumb money. So there's a lot of investor education that needs to go on as well as a blank slate, especially in developing and emerging economies 
where the technology has the opportunity to transform communities leaps and bounds if deployed in the right way. So one um, aspect of um, the, this long-term thinking is something that is uh, taken from um, the indigenous peoples around the world. Ancient cultures have shared this concept of a seventh generation principle, meaning the actions that I do today, I need to think about how it will affect seven generations down the line. My children's 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 children and so on. And that is essentially what we need to start training people to think because that doesn't come naturally because that's not how we're taught in schools. And so all of this stuff is related. Doing and deploying is related to thinking and designing and creating. And that all relates back to education. So what we think about the future, we're thinking about everyone's heard of the next industrial revolution, uh, you know, the fourth industrial revolution, industry 4.0. But that's just at the top, the tip of the iceberg. When you look at what is needed to prepare ourselves for the uh, industry 4.0 and the next industrial revolution, we need to think about how we train our brains to develop the new mindsets and the new ways of thinking and learning in order to even be prepared for the future of doing. So we have to go from the future of doing, the next industrial revolution, to the more important, the future of learning and education and schooling are two different things. Uh, and that is the future of learning. And then um, we need to go from the future of learning in order to be able to have the self-awareness, have the open-mindedness, have the empathy, have the uh, soft skills, the emotional intelligence to be able to change our minds and our mindsets. That requires another fundamental layer of shift of our experience as you know, society. And that's what I call the next existential revolution. So the industrial revolution, the next cognitive revolution, and the next existential revolution to shift how we actually um, step into our own power and become more human. And that's where it's very interesting when we have so many emerging technologies. Uh, you know, we work with a lot of startups, AI, blockchain, IoT, yada, 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 you know? And I'm actually very bullish that AI is actually going to help free up our mind space and our heart space to become more human and do the stuff that we're actually meant to do. Our minds, we're not meant to just sit behind a desk in a cubicle entering data or that, that that's machines do that, right? Uh, and, and, and doing the remote and tedious work. What we do, what we're supposed to do is far beyond that. And that is where then we can actually level up in terms of our capacity, our capability, and how we're going to be able to innovate and to think. And so there's a lot of big concepts to grasp here but it's all interconnected. And so that is, that, those are some of the exciting things that um, I'm working on and it requires a whole global village. There's that saying that it takes a, you know, a village to raise a child. Well, it takes a, you know, a village to raise a startup. It takes a, a global village to raise up humanity and it takes everybody understanding that we are all connected. And these are some of the fundamental principles that, um, that we see as some of the, the best skills that are needed that need to be taught going forward to help prepare people. And, and, and so that's, um, you know, that's essentially what we see as a mindset shift. And then um, from that mindset shift, a broader way of thinking of how we approach problems problem solving, design, business models, forward thinking, sustainability, and looking at all the stakeholders. And a lot of times when I talk to startup founders, they say, oh, my stakeholders are just my company, my, 
my employees, my customers, maybe my investors. But then what about the community that, that has the manufacturing plant that uh, manufactures whatever widget goes into whatever hardware you're building or the, you know, the, the community that is um, being affected by the pollution of the plant that is uh, supplying you with yada yada. You know, so there's a lot of, lot of things that people aren't aware or uh, forget about that actually have ripple effects over the course of time in how the planet is being treated in how uh, the welfare of local communities uh, are. And we have an opportunity now to really shift that. I think a lot of people are awakening and realizing that there is a lot of work to be done and that we need to fundamentally shift how we approach what we're doing. And so that, that has been a blessing in disguise in terms of during all of these challenging times, where do we find that silver lining? And so, so that is essentially, um, you know, a, a summary of the many, many multitudes of factors that go into redesigning a future that works for everybody. Uh, and, and it's not easy. It's definitely not easy. You have to have a lot of patience. You need to be able to understand and talk to everybody, even if they might disagree with you or it might not share your worldview. It takes a lot of cajoling, a lot of influencing, and a lot of optimism and a lot of stubbornness to be able to continue on that path when a lot of times you feel like you're just you know, shouting to nobody and kicking it and dragging everybody else along with you, kicking it and screaming. But it is where we're going. And, and it's exciting to be on the ground to see all of this firsthand and to connect the dots and to, and to make sense of all the patterns that are happening. So that is um, essentially what I mean when I talk about a brave new world. What are the challenges? What are the changes that need we need to do and how do we actually get there? How do we prepare ourselves to begin to make those changes? Changes is not easy. Ch changes are not easy. They are very hard. People by nature are resistant to change, right? And especially when we're talking about habits and we're talking about one's perception of the world, one's worldview, which is shaped from childhood and how do we level up? Right. And so it starts from the individual. And fundamentally, when we understand that we are sums of parts of the whole, right? Everything is um, everything is connected. And that is uh, what we found success um, works and is the most successful indicators if somebody is going to be a success or not, whether you're hiring for an employee whether you want to invest in a company, whether or not a project is going to work, you, um, you look at how that person is able to adapt and able to grow beyond and see what nobody else can see. And when we talk about resiliency and regeneration, it goes back to two fundamental mindsets, fixed mindsets and growth mindsets. And the growth mindset is one of the biggest predictors of whether or not someone is going to be able to be successful in the future. These are also the most sought after skills that are uh, in high demand, and especially because most people don't know how to teach it, which is why we developed our online regenerative school. So we can teach all of these skills to everybody uh, in a way that can be applied to the real world, to bridge theory and reality. And the World Economic Forum has identified many of these skills, complex problem solving, analytics, uh, systems thinking, leadership, creativity, emotional intelligence, leadership, all of these skills as the most essential skills, and the fastest growing skills needed in a future because it's not about the subject. Nobody cares about the subject anymore because that subject might be obsolete in another two years. You're gonna have, it's about, is that person willing, open, and able to learn rapidly? 
And so we need to teach not the what, but we need to teach the how to learn. And we're going to need to be able to adapt much more rapidly. And it is that how to learn, that building that intellectual curiosity for life, that is one of the biggest indicators and differentiators between someone who's going to be successful in the future, especially as, a, as a, uh, you know, uh, when you look at a young person and their trajectory versus someone who's going to stay stagnant or get laid off from their job because they were not able to keep up or learn the new skills or um, you know, be not, not be replaced by machines. And so I wanted to share some of this with you. Um, and I'm, they said it was a meet and greet. So I'm uh, open to questions. Um, I think it's, you know, I've been told it's a fairly free flowing format. Um, so I'm also open to questions now if, if you guys have any. Um, Or I don't know if the, the host, uh, if you have any questions. Um, Ma'am, yeah. yeah, I have a question because I was just uh, listening on about this uh, regenerating uh, kind of uh, the thing. So my question at this time is, uh, do, are we equipped? Uh, you, you travel across the world, you travel across country, you travel across entrepreneurs. So my question is, how does, how does this maybe post COVID how how can this give a great impact in the uh, in the field of entrepreneurship? Uh, I mean, a regenerative mindset. How how can it made possible across uh, having building a sustainable ecosystem? Well, it allows you, especially it's, it's a very big competitive advantage. You get to play chess while everyone else is playing checkers, right? Because the game has moved to chess, but most people still feel it, the game is still checkers, and so it. It allows you to build a sustainable business model. And, and, and that's something that I wanna stress is with all the overhyped you know, investments and the, the craziness with investing in buzzwords and, and all of that, the, and all the dumb money being poured onto bad investments, there has been a lot of forgetfulness in terms of what it actually means to have a sustainable business. People have forgotten about unit economics. They've forgotten about a lot of the early financial metrics and a lot of the uh, people-based metrics for success. And everyone is just piling on and piling on and piling on. And the VC model, the venture capital model is, is broken. And so specifically with startups, they have the opportunity to do something that is not, has not been done by their peers and it might seem very scary because it, you're always, you know, uh, looked at as, as being the, the crazy one if you're the first. But it also represents a huge opportunity to create, cast a wider net in terms of new customers that you never would have thought of. Uh, and since you expanded your thinking and expanded how you approach your business and have a more inclusive business model and more forward thinking business model, you expand your stakeholder network. And if you figure out that each of those stakeholders has a problem, identifies the real problem, and you can identify that solution, then you just automatically increase your revenue streams. You increased your uh, customer lifetime value. You increase the amount, a number of different solutions uh, and channels in which you can sell them. You, and, and so you have been able to um, amplify basically create a force multiplier through that mindset shift. Uh, and you're gonna be able to amplify your effects. Uh, and if we design it in a sustainable way also, then it can create greater, better jobs. It can um, it more positively influence your community. Uh, and you know the triple bottom line, people, planet, profit. And that is what we're, you know, we're striving for in this, in this post COVID age and looking for new ways to do that. And we're already seeing innovative VC firms uh, and companies start leading the way. Uh, and most people are still have their heads stuck in the sand, but there's a lot of innovating, number of innovators out there. So uh, one of the advisors for the Hungry Lab, and, and I'm also involved in one of his 
ventures called Awake Biz. But Awake VC is run by uh, uh, an investor um, and su a successful entrepreneur startup founder who's exited himself. His name is Amit Bator. And, um, and, and we're working on something called Awake Biz, and it's to educate startup founders exactly on this. And it is, uh, you know, and he has created something that is a, a platform where everybody can join, and it's all about value co-creation. So that you take out the aggregators and the, the that are you know sucking out all of your margin. Uh, for example, if you sell on Facebook or whatever, they they take a, a big margin from you, and disaggregate it to allow in uh, you know people to be able to uh, generate value and retain more of that value, as well as the attribution factor. So it allows everybody in the stakeholder network to get their fair share. And it's this equity, uh, and um, that this is you know this disintegration, uh, disaggregation, and the focus on distributing uh, more equitably. That is the heart of this new value co-creation model, and so he, that's just one example. Um, we're working with a few other folks. Uh, we have a startup that we're incubating called Power Mitra. And it's a solar energy company. And the business model is designed around their win-win-win platform that allows for multiple streams of value co-creation that brings returns to everybody who participates, as well as uh, create jobs and vocational training for disenfranchised youth. And so that is, um, you know, that's, it's exciting when we're seeing um, new ways of doing things and seeing incremental successes. It's still so new and still so experimental that, you know, we don't have a historical 10-year, you know, history of, 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 of data. But what we're seeing is based on, is built based on the, the you know, the insights and the, the failures and successes of the past with anticipating the needs of the future. And, um, and, and so there's a number of different, um, you know, innovators out there all around the world who have woken up, if you will, and have seen uh, a different way of doing things and are actually brave enough to, to implement them. We're also seeing this in terms of VC investment. So one of the, just give Africa, for example, I spent um, some time working both in East Africa as well as West Africa, especially in agriculture, because agriculture and, uh, is 60% of the economy. And it is uh, a huge um, you know, influence in terms of the livelihoods of women, especially. And uh, one of the biggest issues is that the next generation does not find agriculture attractive enough to go into it. Uh, but the startups are making headway because there's a lot of work in ag tech and the ancillary industries around ag tech, for example, fintech insurance, all of those things related to, to agriculture. And, but historically there has been, especially in developing countries and especially in places in, across Africa, where there has been no foundation for investing in early stage or seed stage companies. And you, you either have the very small, the microfinance, like the Kiva, uh, you know, or the Grameen Bank, uh, but you don't, and then you have the impact investments at the higher end, and then you have your traditional VC, Series A, Series B, and then you have your private, private equity funds. But there is a missing middle, the micro MSMEs, the micro and small medium entrepreneurs that have suffered a lot um, because um, they have not been able to get the resources that they need, not just money, but mentorship. And, and so what we're trying to do and working with VCs that have woken up to this is help create the incubation infrastructure. And part of what the Hungry Lab does is uh, fill the gap in terms of uh, global incubation for MSMEs, especially social enterprises. And there has been that funding gap. And so now there's actually a, a, a VC called Launch VC in Africa, my friend, Zach George. And he is creating a C, he, he, he already ran uh, Africa's most successful and largest accelerator. And now they're, they've seen the need for this in the gap in the marketplace. And so now they're creating a seed fund for specifically for seed stage companies. And 
So they're seeing and, and they're and they're and they have a lot of different requirements um, to make sure that the company is sustainable, that it has you know unit economics, that it is going to be um, uh, more positioned for success than uh, other investors. And so we're seeing uh, the trends that 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 they are people are starting to understand and they're starting to explore ways to fill the gaps in the market that are critically needed um, for everyone to be able to participate. We're losing out on so much when we don't have a pipeline from school to startup or school to workforce. And, um, and that is uh, something that we're also seeing. Uh, people are trying to fill that gap. Uh, and uh, one of the company, one uh, one company in Thailand, uh, a fintech and tech company called Sunday Insurance, they are a startup, but they're already working with universities to create a pipeline uh, and, and training and internships, practical internships where the students can get trained in AI on the ground in their company, in the startup. So they can have developers, quality developers to hire from because there is that gap in the market for quality AI developers because the schools still are teaching very outdated um, you know, programs that are not sufficient for what the workforce, especially what startups need. So they're creating their own workforce pipeline, working with schools. And so with, for every problem, there is a solution. And all of these, what all of these have in common is seeing that, yes, I might sacrifice some short-term returns, but the long-term benefit is worth it. And there is that social um, element, that social innovation element, as well as the observation that this gap in the market uh, is a huge potential. These previously ignored people that we thought couldn't make us money are now our potential customers, now our potential investees, now our potential mentees, because they represent another wider network of uh, possibilities and opportunities because we expanded our thinking and, um, and our mindsets to, to observe that. And so, um, so that, that, those are some, just some, a few of the many, many examples out there that, um, that we're seeing and, and we're collaborating with many individuals on this front. Uh, thank you, uh, B. That was uh, that. That was and that, my well, next question comes here. So we are speaking about uh, uh, IoT, blockchain, etc. So you have traveled across different countries. Uh, so in terms of in, when we consider an Indian market or Indian ecosystem, it's always customer driven. Indian market is mostly customer driven. When right. I say this, uh, so when I say this, what is your viewpoint that blockchain or artificial intelligence can um, make a big break? in Indian market, artificial intelligence or, or blockchain? Okay, let me start with blockchain, then I'll go into AI. So there's a couple things and I wanna clear up some misconceptions about blockchain. Uh, first, um, you know, it has a huge environmental footprint. And, and, and so that's a negative. Uh, second, and to be very honest, and people don't like it when I say it, but it's true. Customers don't care at all about whether something is built on blockchain or not. Of they course, just want of course. To, I agree. They just want it to work, right? And so nobody cares what your back end is. So, so, and, and that doesn't sound sexy, right? But that's the truth. Now, now, what, now, what does that mean? Well, blockchain has its ups and downs. There's also the security, the timing, you know, all, all that stuff. And people, it's not a panacea. People jumped on it like they do a lot of, you know, hyped up trends. It does have the ability to, and, and crypto is a different topic altogether, but the core blockchain technology at its heart was designed to, uh, for disintermediation, meaning that it would allow people to have a more honest and transparent framework to keep track of transactions, what have you, uh, in a way that didn't require a centralized uh, gatekeeper um, that had all the power and it allowed everyday people now to have the power to, to do that. 
we're seeing it in a lot of aspects for development. Um, you know, the World Economic Forum has actually partnered with Ethereum for remit remittances for Syrian refugees using cryptocurrency, using Ether. And then there's a lot of, you know, other innovations uh, out there. Uh, for example, in Africa, using blockchain to, uh, as a way to grant titles for uh, smallholder farmers, especially women who may not be able to read, who didn't have traditional titles to their land. And that is, uh, and, and who the, the traditional banking uh, or legal uh, framework uh, did not include these women. And so blockchain was a great way for them to have access and get titles for their land in a way that is in, not corruptible. Um, and because corruption obviously is, is also a big thing. And so blockchain solves for a lot of these issues. There are other, um, you know, there's blockchain 2.0, there's blockchain 3.0 now, um, there's, you know, something called Hedera hashtag. Uh, that is another type of innovation supposed to be faster, supposed to be quicker, more secure. Uh, but the, the, the bottom line is it doesn't really, um, it has to be able to be applied. It can't just be blockchain just to have a hype buzzword. It has to work. It has to have a sustainable business model. It has to have a community to be able to support it because of all of the, the um, you know, the, the operational things that required a community for, for blockchain. Now with, with AI, uh, India is actually one of the leaders in AI, in, uh, especially in, in Asia. And um, if you take away the high income countries like South Korea, Singapore, um, Japan, uh, India in Asia is the leader that has gotten uh, by far the most funding uh, and the most startups um, involved in AI. And what is great is that because there are a lot of problems in India, there are a lot of people looking for solutions. And, and so a lot of the AI is actually being deployed by uh, just by default to social innovation challenges. For example, uh, helping farmers diagnose disease, uh, you know, helping uh, increase the, the uh, uh, reduce food waste uh, along the supply chain using AI, uh, and AI in education, AI in uh, 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 smart cities, uh, in clean energy. And so that is uh, really great to see in India. Another thing is India actually compared to, you know, other countries, uh, especially in other developing countries, India has a good legal uh, framework. And it has in the past few years, adopted a lot of regulations that other countries don't have yet related to, you know, especially like fintech, uh, and, and all those things. So there's a greater, there's a bigger framework in India to work from. And it's got so much talent uh, and so many hungry young people, uh, you know, who are, who are wanting to, to succeed. So it has a, a great amount of potential and I am very bullish on India. Uh, and that's why I spent, I'm actually in India right now. I spend a lot of time, um, you know, working in India, um, working with startups in India, colleges, accelerators, uh, investors, and, and the whole ecosystem. And so, so that is, those are the pluses that I would say. Um, there is, you know, from, from an adoption point of view, depending on who your customer base, base is, regular Indian consumers are pretty much used to your apps that all deploy AI, you know, Swiggy, Zomato, all of that stuff. When we're talking about bureaucracy, that's a different, uh, like any place in the world, the government is always slow, typically. And a lot of times there is the inherent uh, fear of the unknown, especially when they're worried that AI might take their jobs. And that is consistent with most countries in the world, that type of old mindset that needs to shift and needs to change. So, um, so that is something that we, we see as a, you know, another area of opportunity. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I have a couple of questions as well. Should I, uh, can I keep it for last? So if you have, you should share something, we'll, we'll proceed with it. Uh, sure. How much time do we have left? I just want oh, to be... no, we have, we have other, uh, 20, 25 minutes. Probably. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. 
Yeah, so uh, that, you know, I, I'm, yeah, you can feel free to ask those questions. Uh, I, I would like to, in, uh, I wish to uh, introduce you, like we have a few key people uh, in this webinar as well. Uh, one is Mr. Uh, Arun Rajiv Shankaran, he is, uh, he is one of the, uh, he's a CEO of one of the leading organization in Kanyakuma district. It's a banking financial software company. Uh, I would like to say hi to Arun Rajiv, sir. Hi, Arun Rajiv, sir. Uh, hi, hi, uh, Rahul. Hi, BM. Uh, uh, welcome. Uh, happy to see you uh, part of the webinar and uh, thanks for sharing your ideologies and uh, um, thanks for sharing your experiences. Uh, it'll, it's a it's lot more uh, insightful for us. Uh, we are, we are uh, growing startup e um, ecosystem here. So it is very insight insightful for us. Thank you so much for attending. I'm, I'm really happy to hear from you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, my, my, my question, I uh, have question is, so what would be point on lean manufacturing? Because we speak about uh, uh, lean manufacturing, lean, uh, we even speak about regenerative entrepreneurship or regenerative development. I think lean development comes in this. Am I right? Oh, now? absolutely. Yeah. A lean method, it's just one another methodology that helps startups innovate faster uh, and more efficiently. And so we apply lean uh, methodology and um, to, to uh, all of our startup incubation programs. And I always encourage everyone to read the Lean Startup, um, the, the book, it, it's great. Yep. Thank you, thank you so much, ma'am. And my next question is in terms of investors, uh, so we have N number of investment who, who, who in N number of investors, uh, even in, across the world or in India as well, who are really interested to invest on innovative products that could produce sustainable development. But at the same time, at the same time, maybe in an year, as per the IBM research uh, report or even the case study that all my own company have done, uh, we have uh, studied that across 36% uh, of companies fail somewhere in some point of time. And there are X num N number of reasons for that. But according to you, what may be the uh, reasons why these startups fail? Okay, that's a great question. That's actually one of the reasons why the Hungry Lab was born. Uh, our startup incubation uh, arm was born uh, to exactly solve this. Because what we realized in the early days was we were getting a lot of people who had graduated from incubators and accelerators and they had come to us and they said they still didn't really learn anything. And we, we found out that we still had to handhold them a lot uh, and teach them the baby steps. And, um, and, and so what we learned is uh, one, uh, the one size fits all doesn't work. And that's what a lot of incubators and, and accelerators they work on is just the, the very cookie cutter standardized model uh, without a lot of attention to individual mentoring. And a lot of times there was a mismatch we found between the founder and the abilities of the mentor or the perspectives of the, the incubator. And so that the, the, the matching is very important. And we've developed a lot of smart matching to help solve for a lot of those challenges. The second is they were focused too much on the product without forgetting that you, without a business, you can't sell a product. And without customers knowing about your product, you have no one to sell to, right? And without a fit, you're, without a product market fit, you're not gonna have anyone willing to buy. And so what we found is there, what we found was there needed to be a lot of programs and training related to how do you actually run a business and get it to scale? How do you actually hire uh, and retain a good workforce and, and personnel when you need it? And how do you bootstrap early on so you're not just throwing away investor money or your savings? And to do that, because that's something that we saw over and over and over and over again, people spending money on the wrong things. And that takes a level of self-awareness too. And that that was the fundamental thing why we decided to create a holistic wellness and a mental mindset uh, training program for startups. Because we found that a lot of startups, they had you know the investment, they had a prototype. They had, uh, you know, hungry founders with commitment, and yet they still c came up to a lot of challenges that they could not surmount because of their own negative self-talk, 
the own, uh, you know, individual issues, uh, personal issues they had to deal with, confidence issues. And these are things that don't come out until you actually sit with them. And we ended up having to be like the therapist uh, and, and, and uh, mentor to, to so many of these startups and not just the advisor and the coach. It's, it's because the, inter, the intrapersonal issues and, uh, um, and the stress and the ability to manage stress, anxiety, depression, a lot of the things that startup founders face but are too scared to admit or to share with anybody, those take a toll. And we saw that damage over and over and over again. And when they came to us, we already saw the consequences of that because they, they didn't even real, they didn't know what they didn't know. They didn't realize the own obstacles and blockages they were putting onto themselves because of whatever blockage was in their head or, the, um, and, and, um, and, or their patterns. And we had to literally help break them out of it in order to get them to change what they, want, uh, what they were doing and to get them to have the confidence and the courage to change what they were doing, right? And so that is um, a, something that we have found that a lot of traditional um, incubators and accelerators don't focus on. And so we work with a lot of them and partner with them to create holistic models and programs and training to work on the person, right? Because ultimately it's people, it's individuals that run a company. And when you don't have healthy, well-balanced people, nothing is going to work. So that is, um, you know, some real life observations that we found them. Um, yeah, thanks, uh, ma'am. And uh, there's other question which I have in mind. Uh, when, when we speak about this balancing kind of ecosystem, one, uh, investors are very much interested to invest in core products or product development companies. At the same time in India, in a country like India, there are, uh, uh, there are a lot of, uh, training companies all as well training companies also uh, there are companies who train and uh, train and uh, develop students on design thinking or uh, or any any kind of even even my company if i say if, if i hold a my company even my company we train people on design thinking and how to uh, make innovation but normally investors won't be interested to invest in this kind of uh, training companies is there some particular reason uh, with a kind of uh, the, 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 is, is there some reason for this kind of maybe a kind of uh, when we speak about the global ecosystem sustainability for all development for all is this the right kind of approach sorry the, what is the right kind of approach uh, i mean uh, when we speak about balanced ecosystem we speak about balanced investment in terms of investors investors will be very much interested to invest on product development companies or yeah. they in, they are ready to invest on in products but in, uh, most of them are not interested in investing in any training and development companies. There are n number of training and development companies who who uh, who have making a sustainable impact, but they won't be interested to invest on that. And also, most of the uh, incubation centers they are also not ready to accept any of those training companies. So, is there any reason for it in particular, or might be a kind of in a kind of empathetic consideration, is there some reasons for that? Well, I think it depends on what investors you go to. If you go to a tech investor, they're not going to invest because you're not their, uh, you know, training company is not their demographic. They want something that is a software product that is uh, scalable, right? Training programs are labor intensive without the technology. And so they aren't necessarily scalable. So the, the fit between the investor and the investee is wrong. There, now you have to find an investor who is willing to invest in training uh, programs and can help you level up and, and grow that and help you figure out a way to scale that. Uh, and, and maybe it could be where they invest in you to build a tech platform. That's something we've seen where service-based businesses have been able to succeed in getting a tech investor when they pitched to the investor that they needed the money to build out their tech platform. Uh, to help them scale up the service business, right? And so this is something we advise startups all the time. Make sure you, because we see the mistakes happen over and over and over again. One of the biggest mistakes that founders make is getting the wrong investor. The color of money is very different between investor A and investor B, 
right? Even if they're investing the same amount. Are they gonna be able to provide the mentorship? Do they understand the industry? Um, or do they don't know anything, they're just throwing money at it and then they're gonna blame you and they're gonna come after you for their money after one year, right? And so this is something that is a very crucial and a constant mistake we see. So the match between investor and investee, both in terms of risk profile, industry, demographic, experience, all of that matters. And, um, and, and so that is uh, very, very important. So with invest, uh, so I, you know, and we've seen um, the, the, that model where investors, tech investors will invest in a service business that has proven to be growing, revenue making, uh, and now they need an investment to scale up and build a tech technology to help them grow further. It depends on how you pitch it. It depends on what your growth story is uh, and, and who you're going to. So, uh, so ma'am, we have two more, two more questions which I'll keep for last. Uh, so maybe we can proceed with your presentation uh, and we'll take some questions at the last. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm okay with uh, continuing to answer questions. Um, and my, my presentation is, um, you know, the, oh, I wanna add a, a couple things. One, when people ask, you know, what do you look for in an entrepreneur? Um, especially one that um, I wanna work with and, and help develop and, 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 and um, help in, in, one of, in one of our many programs is, I look for um, someone who has drive. I look for someone, you know, that hunger. I look for someone who isn't just book smart, but more importantly, street smart or has that intuition, uh, both the emotional intelligence uh, and the technical, and you don't need to be a technical, you know, a technologist or an engineer to be a founder, um, but to understand and have that curiosity to observe and ask the right questions whenever you're approached with a problem to find a solution because you're gonna be problem solving every day as a startup founder. I also look at uh, coachability. Do they have the humil uh, you know, ability to learn? Uh, because that's something that we found. It was very eye-opening when we made all of, these, uh, we, all of these observations. There were so many startup founders that had graduated from accelerators and incubators and, and still said that they didn't really learn anything. And the reason why, and we kept asking why, this seems weird, like how come, you know, you were in this program for two months, how come you didn't learn anything? And it was because what we found out was they were taught in a way that didn't allow them to retain anything. And they were taught in a way that was so theoretical or standardized they did not know how to apply it to their own situation. And so they did not, so applied knowledge versus just knowledge is a huge difference. And people didn't know how to apply it to their situation, which is where most of the handholding, uh, we need to do most of the handholding in helping them learn how to apply knowledge to their own situation. And that's critical. Uh, and that's a key skill set that we look for. Do you have the coachability or learnability to be able to apply what you learn? And the in and, and the final one is is humility. Do you have the humility to accept your mistakes? Do you have the humility to ask questions, to ask for help, to admit when something didn't go well? Uh, and to, because everything, there's no such thing as failure. I mean, it's just learning and learning and learning, uh, you know, iterating and iterating, iterating, right? If you learn from it, it's not a failure. And so it's what we, what we deem as, um, so those are the main qualities that I would say are really important. And those are a lot of the qualities that um, we found we ended up needing to help nurture and help develop. Um, and if you have three out of the four, um, it was harder than having four out of the four, right? And so 
And if you didn't have humility, you didn't have anything. So that is um, something that I, I'd like to share as well. Uh, thank, uh, thank you so much, uh, Brian, ma'am, for that uh, one thing. So before the, going to my questions, shall we take some questions from the attendees here? Um, so attendees, like you can uh, raise your hands so that I can unmute you for if there are some valid questions you would like to ask or you could uh, post your questions in the chat box so that I can, I can uh, read it for you and we'll sort the, uh, sort the answers from our guest. So some questions from our audience, a valid questions if you wish to post. And I have one question from DMBA. Uh, not sure who is it. Uh, Ma'am, the question is, what are the key skills required for budding entrepreneurs in India? Besides the ones I just mentioned, I'd say um, the ability to pitch. And I don't mean just standing on a stage and delivering your PowerPoint uh, on demo day. As a startup founder, you are pitching every single day of your life. You are pitching in some way for a co-founder. You are pitching in some way to get a, a, a talented developer to get a vendor to uh, discount their services because you're cash strapped. You are pitching in some way to get a customer to say yes. Every day of your life is pitching in some way. And how you would pitch to a customer might be different than how you would pitch to uh, an investor or a vendor. And so the ability to understand how to pitch and how to empathize and how to cater and customize your language and your demeanor uh, and your connection with the other person, very, very, very vital. Uh, and, and so that is um, something that I would highly recommend. You know, we do a lot of pitch training uh, in various different scenarios, various different uh, situations, because we found that that was a critical skill that was lacking. And so we develop programs around that. Now, uh, another thing is, um, uh, I would say the ability to ask what's next, right? To not be complacent, right? I always say that uh, the most dangerous words are the most dangerous phrase is we've always done it that way, right? We've always done it that way. Very dangerous phrase. And if you are complacent or seeing yourself get complacent, that's where the culture becomes toxic, starts becoming toxic. That's where you start losing talent because you're not innovating. That's where you are start, uh, you start getting outpaced by the competition. So always be thinking ahead. And they actually say, you know, I heard someone say, I forgot, forgot who, but I thought it was brilliant when they said, a good CEO looks up and out. You're always looking up, out, observing how everything is connected, the trends in the future, planning for the, the future, all of that. A good COO looks down and in, right? And the marriage of a good CEO up and out and a COO down and in is what makes a great team uh, in addition to your tech guy and you know, all of that. But, the, though, but sometimes in the beginning, it's just you. You don't have another person, right? If you're a solo founder, or it might take you a while to find the right co-founder. A lot of, one of another re reason for why many startups fail is co-founder mismatch, right? Co-founder conflict. So if you can have both, that's my mindset. I keep talking about mindset, mindset, mindset. If you can train yourself to have the mindset of both uh, up and out, as well as down and in, then you've got your bases covered. You've got a more holistic understanding of what your business, how your business is doing and where it's going and what needs to be changed, what needs to be improved. And that is, um, you know, what we call strategic foresight. And it's where you marry, you know, the big picture with on the ground tactics. Uh, and so those, those are other critical skills that you need to have. Yes. So Anup Singh Rana, you have raised your hand. Do you have some questions so that I can unmute you? Uh, good evening, uh, speaker, and good evening, the host. Uh, 
and it's really very nice to have this session. Uh, my question is like, I'm like from the School of Fashion Design, lovely profession university, Jalandhar, Punjab. My question is like, we have a pro, uh, we have an, uh, you know, a unique type of thing. Uh, like we, we are a creative person, right? The fashion or the creative, we are the creative person. We, we have the solutions, not a solution, sorry. We have the uh, creative solution for a particular thing, right? But technically, yeah. but technically we are not sound. Right. So in that case, this type of things we are in, uh, in uh, you know, encounter. So what is solution for this? We have the creative solution. Like, you know, if suppose uh, examples of sanitation point of view, right? So we, we know like we can, we should drive a camera where we can scan it and, you know, we can do the sanitization process by, you know, combining the two technology, but we are not technically sound. So how to, uh, you know, combine this thing. And uh, this is a big problem we are facing, like, the two different, uh, you know, area. We, we can think like, you know, solution will be like this, but technically we are not uh, known how to do it. So how to align this thing? So any, uh, or this is a normal or uh, just, uh, we just need to know from you. There's, there are several, there are several ways. One is that you can never stop learning. So what's stopping you from learning this, right? There are so many free resources, YouTube, Udemy, all of that, where you can, uh, learn a technical skill, okay. uh, but ob um, obviously you can't go from being a designer to a developer overnight, right? It takes exactly. Time. This is but you can, concern, yes. right? So, but so while you learn, you can also look for uh, if you're starting a business, you can look for a technical co-founder, right? You can be, you can be the creative run. A lot of times we'll see, right? The what what we call what we in the U.S. especially in Silicon Valley we call the 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 hustler, the hacker, and the hipster, right? The hustler is the business person, right? Oh, Typically the, the CEO. The hustler, I mean, sorry, the hacker is the CTO, the, the, the tech guy, right? And mm -hmm. then you have the hipster. The hipster is the creative. The hipster is the designer, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so, and, and typically the marketer. And so those three make a great team, the, the separation of those skill sets. So if you can find a good uh, teammate who is a, a tech person, Mm -hmm. who can be your CTO, who has the same vision as you in terms of what kind of company you want to build, how you want to build it, and what customers you want to serve. That would be great too. Okay. Uh, and okay. another thing is I would do research and look into what types of fashion technology accelerators or incubators are out there. There are a number of them. I don't know uh, how many there are in India, but I know in the US there are quite a number of fashion uh, accelerators. Okay. Uh, and you can look into what are their requirements and do they actually help train you if you get accepted into them? Will they help develop your skills? Will they help you match you with the co-founder that is a, a tech person? Uh, or, and, and, and other things. Every accelerator incubator is different in what they offer. Uh, but there are, I would start there also. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Anup Singh, sir. I hope you have been answered. But still, yeah. we could add up. Uh, I could add up you, but maybe, maybe in a later, on. later yeah, platform, yeah. I could, I will add. I will add you. Definitely, I would love to join you later on. Thank you. Yes, yes. I will. I will add you. I will. I'll may, maybe we could uh, make a personal call on that Perfect. and how we could take Perfect. forward. Perfect. Thanks a lot. So some other questions that uh, uh, participants have, or you could post in chat box. And uh, ma'am, the, the next question which I have is. We speak about e-learning startups. Uh, so maybe for the next couple of years, e-learning, you know, uh, I don't know, is there a myth or something? For the next couple of years, e-learning is going to be one of the powerful sector which, uh, which needs to be invested. Uh, so what is your, according to Vpoint, what will be the status of e-learning startups are like, or maybe uploading regional content contents hope I, I hope you understood what i'm speaking about what will be the fate of e-learning startups and how much would it be impact when we start uploading regional contents okay so we've done we're actually doing a lot of work um you know with e-learning and ed, ed tech companies because that's you know the, the future especially in this post-covid age um one thing that we're seeing is it's no longer going to be enough where you just have a platform and, and you upload material. Uh, we're seeing more competition in that. We're, what we're seeing now uh, as a great opportunity is there needs to be more 
startups who are focusing on how to enhance the quality of the online education experience and how to help teachers and instructors uh, better make the transition from offline to online. That's something that many instructors are struggling with and many students are complaining about. It's that quality, right? Uh, and so how do you increase engagement? How do you increase uh, retention, uh, interaction, uh, help you know, reduce stress with the teachers? All of that is going to be great, uh, a great field for startups to go into in terms of improving the quality of online education, not just um, you know, creating more platforms. The language, you know, there's so many uh, opportunities with regional languages, and I think that is a specific um, niche that has a lot of opportunity because, you know, so much of the existing stuff is just English based. Um, and so when you're designing for a new platform, you want to think about who your target market is and what kind of languages you're going to need and what kind of abilities you're going to need. So we work with a number of startups. One of them is, um, uh, you know, has a number of different languages. Uh, I just interviewed a, a startup the other day in, uh, in Myanmar, uh, who is, uh, it's English based, but they're, because they're working with so many small entrepreneurs who don't know English, they have natural language processing AI uh, functions to be able to work in the local Burmese language as well as even some of the tribal languages. And so that is uh, going to be uh, a burgeoning field that has a lot of opportunity, especially if you have a lot of different speakers uh, in that language. Um, and uh, so actually one, um, many years back, there was a NGO uh, started by my friend, Rick and Gandhi, who called Digital Green. And he actually um, was a, a pioneer in local education and he was training farmers to teach local smallholder farmers to teach other farmers in other villages using video recording themselves in their own local language uh, across india and this um, got a lot of traction because it was a huge need for farmers uh, to be able to learn uh, from their other farmers and do it in a way that was cheap. It was just using Pico projectors and they were able to play it uh, on their phones or, or in a, you know, a village you know, production. And they were able to do it in their own local language, which previously wasn't available. So uh, the, the local language market is going to be um, growing and there's a lot of opportunities there. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. And uh, the, the other question is, so, uh speaking about uh, hungry labs so basically what are the opportunities uh, you could be able to provide to the upcoming entrepreneurs yeah we have different tracks depending on whether or not uh you're a student uh if you're a social enterprise a startup a, a second chapter second chapter somebody who has you know spent years in the corporate world and now wants to do something new uh, and make an impact with their life but needs help doing so and so depending on what track you're on, we have different programs uh, for where you wanna go. Essentially, it is helping you uh, um, create that executable roadmap with a village to help support you in your goal to create real outcomes and measurable impact. And it's done so in a holistic way where we have all the seven parts of the healing uh, the the hungry lab working together so we have various different the, the seven parts are the incubator which focuses on incubating individuals and impactful ventures and ikigai which is a japanese concept a spelled a cut uh, i'm going to type it in the chat ikigai and essentially it's the bliss point between what you're good at what you love what the world needs and what you can get paid for and that is, um, you know, we, so we incubate people's potential and capacity to unleash their superpowers and, and purpose to do what they want to do. Even with startups, every startup has their ikigai, every organization has their ikigai, right? And so how do we find your ikigai so you can be uh, create your own competitive advantage apart from what everybody else is doing? Right. Then we have the healing lab, which is that wellness part that I mentioned, focusing on that mental uh, mental part, the mindset part, stress, anxiety, depression. Um, so we have counseling, we have mindset um, training, uh, 
um, you know, uh, mindset coaching. We have a, a lot of different um, personal development and personal growth uh, uh, courses that you can take along and training alongside your business development because those two go hand in hand, right? And then we have something called the Unlab. And the Unlab is basically where you can unleash your voice. Because another critical skill that we found startups founders were lacking and that they needed, so we developed the Unlab for this, is a, a voice. Many people did not know how to communicate effectively. They didn't know how to pitch. They didn't know how to uh, you know, tell their story to an audience to get you know, users. They didn't know how to sell their story to the media to get publicity. They didn't know how to tell the story of their founder to be taken seriously, especially young people. Young founders come to me all the time. They're saying, I'm just a student or I'm only in my 20s. Uh, I, I don't feel good enough. People, I don't, I'm afraid people won't take me seriously. How can I be an industry uh, expert, right? There's so many more people experienced than me. And so in the Unlab, we work on conquering all of those fears and actually leveling you up and elevating you from just a founder to a thought leader. So you can build your own movement. That's where you get your authentic tribe and the loyal customers who will stick with you and the ability to create the, and attract the media, attract the speaking engagements, attract all of that because you are seen as a credible expert in what you're doing, in whatever field you're doing. And then we have the, uh, re, uh, the, the uh, regenerator, which is essentially where if you're a job seeker, right? Not everyone is meant to be an entrepreneur and that's okay. We want people to apply the entrepreneurship mindset to everything, but that doesn't mean that maybe you, you want to start your own business. That's fine, right? And so we have opportunities for job seekers the, and, or anybody that has faced rejection, right? The regenerator going from rejection to redirection to regeneration. And then we have something called the field of future skills, which is where you can upskill and learn not just new technical emerging technolo technologies like AI and other things, but it's where you can upskill in terms of soft skills, meta skills, emotional intelligence, creativity, leadership, all of these things. And then we have the Recubator, which is reinventing startup incubation. And we are a new, the next generation, the next evolution of startup in, uh, incubation. I mentioned before that we had worked with startups and accelerators and looked at solving for the gaps and solving for a lot of the challenges that they faced. And so all of this has come from years of, of insight uh, and working with startups all over the world uh, on the ground to figure out what are their real needs and what, um, how can we truly help them? Not just develop the product, but develop the person. And then we have the Re-Accelerator, which is reinventing startup acceleration and in investment. And that's where we work with a lot of the investors and we, we start creating new ecosystems that we can um, uh, influence to develop a pipeline. So in Tamil Nadu, actually, we're, um, you know, we're working with the MS Swaminathan Research Foundation in Chennai, uh, 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 the Rajiv Gandhi Institute, uh, and a couple other engineering colleges and startups. On, um, we had a multi, uh, we were creating a multi-stakeholder task force uh, that is focused on helping expand uh, and uh, increase the strength of the local ag tech uh, ecosystem there. So that's just one example. Um, and so we are, um, and, and so those are the seven components of the Hungry Lab. So like we said, in Mother Nature, you know, Mother Nature is regenerative and Mother Nature has a place for everyone. Uh, no matter if you're big or small, right? Everybody has a place. And so th that's the ethos in which we created the Hungry Lab is you have a place. As, um, and if you're willing to learn, we will help you get there. And if you're willing to do, and if you're willing to make an impact and make the world a better place, then we have a place for you. So I'm going to share in the link here, um, sign up to our, uh, to our newsletter list, and then we'll send you more information about how to get involved um, and what might fit you and um, you know, how we can help you. So it's, I'm just um, sending it to the, the chat here. 
thehungrylab.com slash join the re-economy, the regenerative economy. So it's a re-economy, rethinking the entire economy. Okay, so you can sign up there in the chat and uh, we're look forward to, you know, uh, seeing how we can help you. Uh, can I, shall I share your screen, ma'am, for, the, for, the, for a second? Oh yeah, sure. I just typed it to everybody in the chat. So hope this screen is visible. So this is the website of the Hungry Lab, uh, as you could see. Uh, so hope the screen is visible. Can I get some yes in the chat box if the screen is visible? So uh, dear participants, could you just give me an yes in the chat box if the screen is visible? Hope uh, it seems the screen is visible. Is the screen visible, ma'am? Yes, I can see it. Yes. So this is the website of Hungry Lab. Uh, so you could go through it, everything. So even uh, the last day, I was just going across everything and really like would allow to join somehow how I could associate with Hungry Lab and I could take forward. So if you want to go to learn more there, if you go to up there, learn more, the integrating components, and then you can sign up there, join the recording. So here is the join the re economy. Yeah. We call it uh, we call it business as unusual because it can't be business as usual anymore. Uh, so in a very short span of time, like uh, people like me are becoming a big fan of uh, you. Uh, you know, I was just I'm, I would listen to your TEDx talks. I was just uh, going to TEDx talks. Uh, you know, being like, no, I was just very much interested in how much these change makers are here, a real, real change maker. Uh, even as a TEDx organizer, I would like to invite you to my platform as well, if sometime permits you to join our TEDx stage, because you know, it's, it, will, it will be great, great, you know, it, it's a kind of great blessing that if you could join us, because you are a real change maker, when real change maker. Okay. Thank you. I'd be honored. I'm, I'm so honored. Yes, I, I'd love to. I know when there are real change makers coming to us and such a, a, a kind of, you know, this concept of regeneration or re-economy, I, I was just, uh, I was just going through it and was just trying to reframe it. As I said, reframe it, how this works or what exactly is. Then I understood, oh, this is the one concept which she is trying to bring, but most of the people would not have imagined. So this is the best thing I, I request all participants to go through this. And this is one big idea you could uh, really share. Uh, Mamani, in India, like for the, maybe for the participants in India, where do we work? I'm, I'm sorry, you cut out there. What um, was the question? Mamani, in India, in India, where do you could uh, meet you up in India? Oh, so we're online. So uh, yeah, obviously everything has gone online since COVID. But even before that, we were starting to push even a year beforehand to push our, our schooling online. And our incubation has been online. Uh, we've done an online incubation since we launched in 2017 because we were based out of, you know, we started in an office in Southern California, but we were working virtually uh, doing online incubation uh, since 2017 with uh, people from New York, from Seattle, uh, from uh, Chile to Singapore uh, and China. So all over. And, and so that's, um, you know, so we, we have been pioneering that. And so we, you, the geography doesn't matter. What we've done is now we're starting to build out country hubs, um, Malaysia, Singapore, uh, UAE and Dubai, uh, and uh, in India now hubs in various parts. So we, we have startups in Mumbai, Chennai. Uh, I'm currently in Trivandrum. Uh, we've been working, I was here for a conference speaking about the future of work. We have a partner here with a, comp a great company called Trinity Skills Works on upskilling, um, you know, young people. And, and so they, they're a great company also that's doing a lot of fantastic work to upskill students and prepare them for the workforce. And so, so the geography doesn't really matter for us, but, um, you know, I love India. And I see so much potential and the young people of India always inspire me. And so it's, it's always, it's great to be in a country where there's just so much energy and so much talent uh, and so much opportunity to make a difference. Um, speaking about, ma'am, the second thing I see great innovations, you know, uh, and uh, Trivandrum, uh, I'm a native of Trivandrum. I was born in Trivandrum and brought up in Trivandrum, but I'm currently I'm in 
settled down in Kanyakumari district, which is uh, some 50, 80 kilometers right from Trivandrum. Uh, so the people now in this district, it has a huge potential. It has a huge potential, mm -hmm. but somewhere uh, they lack a kind of uh, an empathetic development. Uh, as I said earlier, you know there are some startups which have they have started the real impact. They are failing somewhere, and uh, uh, there are some startups. They can, they, it's a kind of a, what we say is exactly to be precise. It's like uh, they are confined to somewhere else, and here we have a lot of training startups, and they are yet to find some uh, grisp uh, grisp in that. Even if, as far as if my company, if I have a company which we do where we train people on design thinking uh, on how to innovate the product. But even we to struggle somewhere, how to take it forward and how we could associate in a long term. So maybe I think uh, maybe a company like me, uh, uh, Hungry Labs would be a best uh, possible, uh, maybe in you know, a guidance, how we could take it forward if I'm not wrong. Yeah, absolutely. We'd love to, you know, we can take talk about this further. Um, what we want to do is offer a platform for everybody to grow and we grow with them. And so we, you know, uh, want to make, uh, and that's part of that smart matching where we want to provide opportunities for all of our members on our platform to connect and to get business and to grow. Uh, and so I think if you're able to contribute uh, to uh, as a member in terms of the network and learn and grow uh, globally, uh, we want to be able to help you get there. And so, so that's the, essentially that thinking that everybody is co-creating together and everybody can share uh, because the more people we have, the bigger the pie. And the bigger the pie, the more we can create sustainable opportunities for everybody. Thank you so much. Maybe maybe some other questions we could take for a couple of questions. Uh, we could take from the participants if there are something. Uh, because you know, uh, you know, she's very by ma'am, ma'am is very active in uh, social media platforms, but you know, it's very hard to manage. she's very much engaged with this community development and uh, uh, skill development. So it's very hard to get her online all the time. So as she's here, maybe you could pose some questions if you wish. Uh, we'll have a quite few quick session for questions. Okay. And uh, also, I'm sharing the, our Facebook page so you can just like us on Facebook. So this is Facebook, uh, the Hungry Lab, uh, which you know you'll be all participants will be getting uh, a mail where all the details of Hungry Hungry Lab will be added uh, so that you know you know you'll be getting, all the participants will be getting your certificates. Uh, for attending this webinar where all the details of Hungry Lab will be there so that you could access at any time and uh, reach to them for uh, prospective development. Because it's a kind of what as an incubation MET incubation center, uh, as Institution Innovation Council of MET Engineering College, or on a personal behalf, we always uh, aim at giving back to the society. So we always follow it. Uh, so maybe, ma'am, I have a final question. Uh, According to you, what are the skills that young generation should develop in uh, in emergency? So you you would have in my in your mind you have this thing like uh, uh, you know these skills has to be developed immediately so that they could be sustainable. So uh, in your viewpoint, what are the skills? Self awareness, uh, self awareness, and um, asking questions, and learning how to learn. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much for that uh, one crisp answer that even I was expecting. You know, uh, and the most of the time we 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 were not aware of ourselves. We we uh, start discussing about the world in a global perspective, but we are not sure how we are or what we are. are right. Where. Yeah, you can't change the world if you can't change yourself, right? And it's everything starts from yourself. Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for that, uh, ma'am. Uh, so I think we are done with the questions, and you know. Uh, thank you so much because I have no words to express my sense of gratitude towards you. You're such uh, generous, you know, uh, you know, a lot of questions. The more than you know, what is important is answering the questions. Asking questions is easy. Everyone can ask questions. But answering to this question, is, it, it, it takes a kind of uh, a sense of responsibility, a sense of commitment. 
and you should be very generous to answer all those questions and uh, you have you are for all the skills and uh, thank you so much for being a good uh, one great change maker of the society and uh, as a, as a person as an entrepreneur as a teacher and uh, as a common man uh, i wanted uh, to see you like going to heights you know even you know in a vein is a epitome of success <laughs> that that's what uh, we aim at uh, thank you so much ma'am for kindly accepting our invitation and spending maybe at most uh, uh, almost one and a half hours with us you know you are quite uh, busy scheduled with your routine activities and thank you so much for uh, spending this much of time and uh, my kind my humble request is uh, to uh, to keep in touch with you Uh, so that uh, you would be easily accessible for all of us uh, maybe you know being a mentor being a guide you could support us in all kind of uh, you know all kind of this giving back to society concept thank you so much ma'am we expect that from we expect this from you thank you so much for being a great uh, change maker great mentor and being inspiration very importantly very inspiration to a lot of uh, entrepreneurs across the, across the world not only india across the world uh you are one of the big change maker even i was uh, going through your linkedin profiles and i've got him you have been a constant uh, speaker in all uh, startup platforms across random so you know then i just started researching you in a very deep deep perspective what she's doing what she's doing i've got n number of uh, you know n number of details i just take i will take the entire day to read out what you are doing <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's why i have to uh, that uh, that's why i was at a start cut short you know linkedin profile ma'am if you, if you don't mind you could share a linkedin profile to the audience yeah. so that they know what you have been doing so dear friends uh, you know you could you could follow her you know lot of lot of activities not only uh, about startup she is doing lot of humanitarian activities as well uh, so you could follow um, uh, by in ma'am uh, maybe she is one of a very positive personality thank you so much uh, bain ma'am for accepting and invitation sharing your we point with all of us it's it's a it's a, it's a honor for us thank you so much i'm on, uh, honored to be here and i'm so happy uh, to have been able to share some of my thoughts and experience with you all and uh, yeah please feel free to uh, please join us uh, at the hungrylab.com/join the reeconomy Uh, you can like us on our Facebook page, facebook.com/slash/thehungrylab, and then I also shared with you my LinkedIn as well. Uh, so maybe if any anything for uh, participant to share, anything to share with the participants, or shall we shall we uh, shall I post the feedback link as we are anticipating? Uh, thank you, Ben, ma'am. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Uh, before we close, uh, let's play the national anthem. uh as a gratitude to our mother nation janagana mana adhinayak jay he bharat bhagya vidhata punjab sindh gujarat maratha dravida utkal banga vindhya himachal yamuna ganga utchal jal dhitaranga तव शुभ नाम जागे तव शुभ आशीष मागे गाहे तव जय गाथा जन गण मंगल दायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे जय 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 Uh, ma'am, on behalf of Institution Innovation Council, MHR Initiative of mm -hmm. MIT Engineering College, on behalf of MIT Business Incubation Center, on behalf of the management of MIT Engineering College, on behalf of Lighting Land and Media X Private Limited, on behalf of my on my personal behalf, on behalf of all the participants uh, over here, a big, 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 big sense of gratitude. Thanks to Madam Bain Lee uh, for setting our invitation and being with us, sharing a lot of ideas. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you again. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye, ma'am.
So dear participants, I can post the feedback link for you so that you can uh, complete the feedback. And uh, get your certificates. So I have posted the feedback link here. So participants, you can complete the feedback link. Um, Anup Singh Rana, sir, like we will schedule a call uh, sometime. And uh, let's, you know, uh, in fashion technology, it's very easy to innovate. As you said, you know, the sanitizing concept is very easy to apply in uh, shirts you make or in saris you make and whatever way, because innovation lies everywhere. Even you walk, there is innovation. You sit, there is innovation. You sleep, there is innovation. You take a mobile, there is innovation. Everywhere there's innovation. Innovation comes in a fraction of seconds. So definitely we could sit down, we could work out how your vision, in fact, it is a great idea that you have shared and uh, common, a uh, lot of person can be done. So let me stop the YouTube live streaming. And thank you so much for all the dear participants who are attending our YouTube live stream as well. Thank you so